to keep it moving quickly. Could I open the floor? Does anyone have a question? Julia, you're going to have to worry. <laughs> Glad you have your tennis shoes on. <laughs> In the meantime, I wanted to thank you. I didn't give you the proper acknowledgement for such an outstanding talk. Thank you so much for that. Yes. So this is the guy, uh, the guy up in the corner. My name is Per Anglistam. I work at the School for Forest Management at this university. And I attended um, a meeting in Paris um, just before Christmas, uh, organized by many organizations about um, landscapes. There was a global landscapes forum. And um, a very important conclusion of this meeting was that there is a lot of um, good policy, but how do you make it land on the ground? And people discussed very much landscape approach. So really bringing people together, bringing in the disciplines, as we heard, and also bringing in stakeholders. So actually, what are your intentions of, of achieving this in reality, on the ground? And what are the resources for that? If, if you ask us, uh, I, I think that this is something that everyone is struggling with. Uh, we are we are addressing that very forcefully in our program to deal with that with both providing background material for for um, you know, policy development and technical things as i said and also i think one of the of the aspects it's, it's a long term perspective and that is that we we really try to build capacity in if you call them low-income countries to influence domestically in, in their countries. I think that is a, is, a, is a very important element that is not only people from, from, uh, from uh, Sweden or, or OECD countries that are, are coming up with background materials for, for, for policy development. So it's a very long-term perspective and it's a hard one. Any other questions? Thomas Rosval. Thomas Rosval, former vice chancellor of this university. I also chaired the CCAFS program on CJIR for six years. Uh, and I want to ask all of you to reflect a bit, or a few of you to reflect a bit on this question about smallholder farmers. Because you said correctly that the farms are getting smaller and smaller. But when I listened to Ulf's comment, it was to also not only close the yield gap, but also ensure a larger farm. And of course, you won't get one ton per hectare for an half hec on a half hectare farm. And this was something we discussed in CGIR a lot, this focus on small holder farmers. What do we mean by that? What is the strategy for make, making the farm provide the livelihood, access to markets and everything that has been mentioned. But can you comment on the size question? How do we move from the farms getting smaller and smaller to something that's socially viable? Because these are not. And if it doesn't become socially viable, people are going to move into, continue to move into the cities and there are going to be no farmers left to handle the half hectare farm. So Thank you for your question, and it gives me the opportunity to bring the other comment on smallholder farmers. So when you look at smallholder farming, because of the risk, the, the, small, the farmer is not sure whether it's maize which is going to give or banana or, may, um, or, or beans. So you tend to see mixed cropping in smallholder farming. So I think if we were to support smallholder farmers to ensure that you're going to have your crops are going to be giving the yield that you need. You have the right maize seeds every year. Mixed cropping will reduce. And then farmers will have more options on what it is that they want to grow. Because productivity sometimes is because the farmer is trying to do too much. Lack of productivity is because the farmer is trying to do too much. So I think if we begin to address that, then we'll get to a point where some farmers will be cropping only one or two things. And then we can see uh, um, the, the, what uh, is the impact of the size of the farm at that, at that particular moment. But I think the dream smallholder farmers is the one 
who has small piece of land trying to do very little in terms of how many crops they are, they, they are focusing on to maximize in terms of productivity. <laughs> Wait, sorry. Well, thank you. <coughs> so we uh, so would you like to yeah. address that same question? Could we wait just one moment, yeah, one well, moment just, please? Just sorry. Think, well, f first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I thought that uh, Apollinaire Gikang made a fantastic presentation here going through, and it's really uh, in a very short and succinct way presented a number of the issues and, and they resonated very well with my own experience from, <coughs> from, from, from IFAD. So uh, I think you had a, a spot on analysis. Uh, on the smallholder farmer, I have only really two things to say. One, there has been a discussion a bit more some years back, but it's looming that do away with the smallholder farmers and go for big, big investments uh, to solve food security issue and then distribute the, the food that you produce in large quantities in large farms. Uh, I think you only need to look at South America to see where that would lead you. It will be a social disaster. You may solve the production challenge, but you will have a social disaster. So you need to take where you are with a smallholder-based farming system and have that developed. And there's not one silver bullet, it's a number of things. And Apollinaire, I think, elaborated on, on them. Uh, let me just say one thing and in, in, in complement to that. I heard the other day, and I haven't seen, had a chance to, to probe further into it, but one person, part of this program, Agnes Anderson Jurfeld, presented a study at the meeting last, was it last week or two weeks ago in CEDA, where she actually saw that, the, albeit small, the average size of smallholder plots in her sample, in her the country she studied, actually increased. So, um, and it'd be interesting to know more about that because clearly uh, I've seen from my own experience both tendencies and where you get to smaller and smaller plots you have a problem. If there is a certain amount of, come, you know, as we have in our countries, and which would be natural to, to see with economic development that you would have a somewhat growing farm size, then issues are a bit different in terms of how you relate to it. But I think the answer is develop organically from the farm size you have with the various kind of you know, system, systemic approach that Apollinaire was talking about. And, and then you know, there will be also need for policy measures to sort of guide the, the development of the farm size. Please. Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention one example. Um, I visited Tetra Laval, and they work with small farmers in Bangladesh. And the typical case was somebody who had a very small farm, maybe one or two cows, that would milk about two liters a day in the beginning of the project. Then there was training of the farmer, there was assured access to markets and the cooling systems, and gradually they were moving up to about 20 liters a day, mm. which meant that they became more of a business. So this is to underline the fact that you need several different factors that work together, and also that you work across uh, uh, borders and across, uh, because this was together with the local authorities, but with the private company involved and uh, the smallholder. So there needs to be large cooperation on several sectors. Mm. Thank you. We have some <coughs> next in line. Thank you. Yeah, <coughs> Ivar Vigin uh, from Stockholm Environment Institute. I'm part of the agri 4 Academy <laughs> or the team. Um, w as as Ulf said, the agri 4 is very much um, an attempt to translate policy and uh, <coughs> well science to policy and um, management response that makes a difference on the ground. Now. I was thinking in, in your presentation, uh, reminded you of a, of, of a study we did on, on, on bioscience innovations in Africa, saying that there's quite a lot of things piling up. There's a lot of actually R&D that has enormous impact, potential enormous impact, and 
we, we don't we're not short we're not, we don't have a shortage of R&D sort of efforts but the problem is that a lot of this R&D is indeed demand driven but it's not business driven so a lot of it piles up in in institutions and never reaches farmers or 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 um, agricultural systems i wonder if you can sort of uh, comment a bit about that how how in 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 your world do we sort of scale up and and, and we talked about you talked about tetra laval there being an agent for for that sort of uh, connection to r and d making it scaling it up to 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 um to farmers <coughs> so i think that is a critical area how do we how do we sort of go from r and d to to an impact and how do we incubate what's being on the ground thank you thank you um, Iva. i i you rightly say you know we have there's no shortage of r and d it's not just in agriculture it's also in human health you know where you have a scientist in one lab showing that you can diagnose a disease very easily with a small uh, through a small pcr and a simple pcr and stuff but the translation, research into use, is where the gap has always been. You mentioned the private sector. The private sector, you know, I read a paper in the New York Times more than 10 years ago, a big farmer saying, you know, for African trypanosomiasis, it's disease of poor people, we don't even want to waste time, we would rather develop Alzheimer medicine for dogs and stuff like that. Mm. So it is, it's always the, you know, we, we've talked about the private sector. But where the private sector does not see the incentive, there must be some other pushes. And I mentioned the governments, you know, the, the notion of incubation. When we look at our innovation systems, what are the key players? If we leave that to private sector, the private sector, if it's not a ready-to-go market, they're not going to come. But we have to have other mechanisms where governments should say, you know, we want to invest in this area to put this research into use. So once you start, uh, to, to, when you, once, you tra once you transition or close that gap, the market becomes very obvious in terms of distribution and production of what you have produced and stuff like that, the private sector will come in. So the problem that we do have is not that the R&D, as you said, is not there. We have enough of it. We have so many things that we, have, we know and, and products that can be calibrated and sent out but we need that push and I'm still going back to um, social entrepreneurs to governments you know what is it that we can do if you're looking at Nestle or Pfizer they're not going to come tomorrow or Monsanto and stuff like they will come only when the market is there but you need that last push and you've been involved in you know in discussions with that in the innovation system it's still an ongoing discussion but we have to define the players and define incentives. But somebody has to be carrying the biggest weight, and I still go back to governments and some of the foundation to put an initial investment. And if you, if you see the global challenges that were set up by the Gates Foundation are now everywhere. They say in the global challenges, they're not funding project that will work. If your project will work, if you know by 80% that your project will work, just channel it through the normal process but they're funding things that are almost impossible. You know, this is where we have, we have to have some of these global challenges helping us to, you know, to put our research into use. May, may I just add one comment to that? Uh, I very much agree with what you said, but it was interesting from my own experience when you looked at the smallholder farmer and you looked at food security and you looked at poverty and famines in the past, you very much looked at making basically subsistence farming more productive or more secure. Uh, there was a quite a change that meant a lot when, and this of course came gradual in different institutions, I was part of it in IFA, when you saw the smallholder farmer as uh, part of the economic system, as a small business or having the possibility of linking to the market and become a small business. Because then you bring in other elements of what is making that life sustainable and productive. And in that way, that seeing that the smallholder farmer is the smallest entity in the market economy in many places will 
give a different perspective on what kind of measures you prioritize and what kind of measures you would recommend as a government or as uh, an international agency or in the extension service. So uh, that change of mindset can be very profound in its effects. Yeah, my name is uh, Marina Elbakitze uh, from a School for Forest Management, SLU. And I work in Ethiopia with uh, small uh, holder farmers uh, who practice uh, agroforestry home garden. And I understand that, uh, I agree that the uh, role of women is extremely, extremely important in food security, especially on the household level. And we made analysis of formal institutions in Ethiopia. And for example, even constitution claimed that women and men have equal rights to access to land. But informal institutions are extremely strong. And how you could change it? Because, because there is a huge misfit between formal institution and informal institutions. And they're extremely strong control in rural areas. How you could change this? I mean, how you could implement this? It's a big obstacle for policy implementation. What should we do with them? If, if, I, if I might just add to that, um, I've had a lot of problems in FAO where pe women are seen as instrumental because you should invest in women because that way hey, children and men will have food. It's just an instrument instead of seeing it as a basic human right. And I think what you have to do is, is it's a very long and difficult path, but one thing that I've also tried to emphasize in FEO is to have statistics that show the situation for women. Many times you have it on household levels, and it's a bit the same as Abolinaire said, that you do not see the differences in the countries. It might look good uh, as an average, but it's the same thing for women. Actually, I had a Kenyan colleague who said to me that it was only when she was an adult that she realized that the fact that mothers never ate at table was not a normal thing. It's just because there weren't enough food for mothers, so they would have to take whatever was at the end of the meal, and then they eat in the kitchen. So, But this is an extremely difficult problem, and that just has to be ground away. There was a an effort made by FAO in conjunction with the government. I cannot remember what country, but it was in Africa where they had facilitators that came every week to a certain village to show that everybody gained by the equality, that the results in the agriculture in other areas would give a larger yield. And that worked very well, but this is the sustained efforts over more than a year. Thank you. I, I, this this issue about informal structures and so, uh, that is not an Ethiopian issue, I think. That is, is, is worldwide, it's called, also called culture sometimes. Uh, I mean, it's, if, if Sweden is the, the presumed to, to be the most equal country between genders in the world, I mean, that has been a very, very long uh, journey for us. And, and it, we haven't seen the, the end, there are still things to, to do. Um, uh, and this is a, is, is, a, is a bad answer for you, but, but I mean, there are no quick fixes for, for, for these changes. And, and of course, I think our, that we have doing analysis to this, we are addressing this. I'm talking about agri for c now. Uh, I, I think that is, is, um, that is our contribution to this. Uh, and uh, then I just want to, to acknowledge one of the things that, that Apollinaire said, and you, you touched it, uh, Cecilia, that is the, that is the risk of, of looking into averages on figures. I, I think that is a big risk in, in, in uh, aggregated figures and, and averages that we can miss very important uh, uh, things and, and also, in, in particular, our actions and means could be totally wrong if we just look into averages. So thanks for that research colleague over there. <laughs> Can I offer a comment? I uh, just want to echo what Ulf says. It's not an Ethiopian thing, but I think it is upon the government 
to, to, to provide support system when the formal system when the formal system provides some guidance as to how things are going to be done for enforcement and also a participatory approach because if a community has been doing things one way for hundreds of years you come today you show a piece of paper and say we are changing it tomorrow you're not going to see the results you have to you have to provide a support system for to provide incentives we do things because we see incentives we are not we talk about philanthropy and stuff like that, but we, our incentive can, can come from the fact that we, we feel happy helping others, but there must be some incentive. So from the government perspective, there must be some support system for everyone to slowly move in that direction. If you see a change, and I think people will, will adopt it. I have to bring this very stimulating discussion to an end, I'm sorry. Is it working? I'm sorry about that. Um, we have refreshments outside, but if we could sum up this day, maybe we'd say that science is important, that this program that we have is actually giving us the raw material to ch for these changes that we're all hoping for, and that the agricultural sector, including all aspects of it that we've brought up today, are so important to meet these development goals. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Please join us for some refreshments after. Take advantage of uh, the time to meet the people working within the program. Ask the questions that we didn't have time. There were several people who wanted more questions. Please take the opportunity to go up and ask questions during the mingle. Thank you very much. A, a round of applause for everyone.